Broadcasting from the Business Radio X studios, here is your R3 Continuum playbook. Brought to you by Workplace MVP sponsor, R3 Continuum, a global leader in workplace behavioral health, crisis, and security solutions. Hi there. My name is Shane McNally, marketing specialist for R3 Continuum. This week's R3 Continuum playbook is going to be a bit different. We're really excited to share that R3 Continuum Medical Director, Dr. George Vergolius, was recently a guest on the Decision Vision podcast. Dr. Vergolius had a conversation with Mike Blake from Brady Ware and Company, where they discussed mental wellness programs and if it's worth considering the implementation of one at your organization. They also discussed best practices for supporting emotional and psychological health, the rise of telehealth, and what it takes to create and implement a mental wellness program successfully. Here's the full conversation between Mike Blake and Dr. George Vergolius. Dr. Vergolius, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mike. It is a pleasure to be here. So um, let's let's start from the basics, because I think I think anybody could def- people could define this differently depending on their context. How do you define mental wellness? So I like I like um, you know the World Health Organization has a I think a very usable and approachable definition. It's they define it as a state of well being in which the individual and his or her, her, his or her own abilities can cope with the normal stresses of life. They can work productively and fruitfully, and they can make a contribution um, to their society. Um, I kind of simplify that a little bit, and I like talking about mental wellness as a synergy between emotional, psychological, physical, and spiritual ways of being in the world that allow us to thrive. So, you know, you've been doing this a long time, obviously. You have a lot of expertise in this field. What, when, when people think about or consider a, implementing a mental wellness program, what does that look like? You know, we, we know what, we know what the, what the, most of us know what a physical wellness program looks like. It could be gym memberships and it could be, you know, walks. It could be, you know, stretching at your desk, not sitting for too long, all kinds of things of that nature, you know, healthy snacks in the, in the break room. But I'm not sure all that familiar with what a mental wellness program looks like. So what in your mind does that look like? And maybe you can share some best practices with us. Sure. Um, Really, it is a program that is designed at at the highest level around meeting the needs of people's emotional and psychological health. I mean, that's kind of built into the definition, right? So what does that mean in terms of best practice? Or what should maybe you consider if you're a leader at an organization? Um, there's a number of things that I'd recommend. And the first is it has to be catered to your organization's needs and to your organization's culture. I'm not a fan of a one size fits all. There are different pain points. There are different needs that different industries, different companies, different cultures. And even in the same company, you might have different regions of the world or of the country in the U.S., that have different needs. So it has to be catered to your needs and culture. It has to be collaborative, both internally amongst um, various departments, as well as with outside vendors that can provide additional resources that you as the organization may not be an expert at. Um, Leaders and managers need to be invested and engaged and accountable at the highest level. I think think a good example of this, um, which also shows some vulnerability is Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook. Strong advocate of a mental health program, came out with her book a number of years ago, uh, Lean In, and really was very open about her own experiences and her own vulnerabilities. That really sets a tone for employees. Um, You want the employees to be engaged and you want their input to be part of the process of developing the program. You need to have a clear rollout and communication plan. You need to leverage technology to support the initiative. On this front, remember technology is a tool. It's not the goal. I think what has happened in recent years is there have been some um, technology-driven giants that have come on the scene that have wonderful apps and they have wonderful engagement in terms of the technology side, but they don't necessarily have the best throughput in terms of impacting functional or behavioral change. And two more things I'd recommend. Consider a plan for anticipated barriers. Given your unique needs and culture, what are the things that you might hit roadblocks on and anticipate that ahead of time? And lastly, you want to address a menu of offerings in that service plan. It shouldn't be, ideally, it shouldn't be just psychoeducational trainings or just peer support or just access to the EAP or access to mental health services. 
one size doesn't fit all. And you really want a range of those things um, as you're applying these programs. So a, an argument might be uh, that employees have it pretty good right now, right? And I'm not saying I'm saying this, but I, I have heard this argument. You probably have too. Employees have not had as much power as they have right now in my lifetime, for sure, um, to kind of pick and choose where they want to work, how they want to work. Um, many of them are, are are working home, and for baby boomers and some Gen Xers, that's that's really you know that seems kind of cushy, frankly. Um, and and so that leads to the question, you know, is this question of a mental wellness program relevant? to organizations that now have large numbers of people working from home, can a company even put something in place to help them? Because with people working at home now, they each have their own individual environments now, they're each individual needs that are no, that are no longer kind of collectivized by an organization, right? They're so diffuse and so diverse now. Does that take a mental wellness program off the table or are there things that companies can do to promote mental wellness, even if you have a largely remote workforce? It's a, it's a great question, Mike. And my answer is it absolutely does not take it off the table. And in an interesting way, it heightens the need. Let me throw out some details for you. Uh, in, in, 20, uh, 20, in March of 2021, the Microsoft Work Trends Report was published. And what they came out with is a number of interesting findings. And I'm just going to throw a few out just to anchor this discussion. They've seen, uh, compared to 2020, as they went into 2021, they saw a 100% increase in the use of Microsoft Teams. The average meeting was extended by 10 minutes. 45% of users were sending, I'm sorry, there was an increase of 45% more chats being sent at random times of the day. And one of the difficulties we were finding is you always had to be on camera. So if you were on camera, What's really interesting that people don't realize is if you're in a board meeting or just a conference meeting at your workplace, you can see the speaker or your boss and you can see if they're paying attention to you. So you can divert your gaze. You can take a sip of water. You can scratch your nose. You can do a million things. What's so odd is when you're on a Zoom meeting with eight people, you don't know who's looking at you at that exact moment. And so as there, there's this sense of you always need to be on. You always need to be completely focused. That's mentally exhausting. And so there's these realities of working remote that has really been difficult. What we've also seen is, uh, this is really a fascinating study, the increased number of emails delivered in February of 2021 versus February of 2020, based on this same study, it increased in the US 40.6 billion more emails were sent. So what's interesting is when you think of chat and you think of email, Think of the disruptive nature. At any moment in the day, these things can come in and interfere with your work pro productivity, with your focus. Um, and it's, less, it's led to real exhaustion. 80% of employees say that they're more productive through 2020 and through 2021, but 60% feel they're overworked and 40% feel exhausted. And leaders tend to be out of touch. A study from about three or four months ago by Deloitte showed that 61% of leaders say that they're thriving but only 38% of employees say that they're thriving. So the point with all of this is, although that remote environment early on seemed really nice, I could pick my kids up, I could eat lunch in my own, you know, I could wear my, my jamma bottoms if I'm not showing, you know, you know, all of these things are wonderful. This sense of merging my home personal life and my work life and not having clear boundaries with all the things I've already mentioned, really resulted in a great deal of emotional exhaustion. And so now more than ever, the, the, the creative but problematic issue is how do we engage employees in a remote work environment in a way that still meets those needs, that meets those behavioral um, and, and cognitive and psychological needs? So it's definitely needed. And it's a, bit, it's a big challenge. You know, it's... The, the the Zoom thing is interesting, and 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 you're right. It 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 is exhausting. It is exhausting to be on camera. I think we all now have a, a greater appreciation for for how hard it is for people who are on TV or the movies as a living, right? And and, and I think also you you become so aware because you see yourself often, right? If you haven't turned off your own sort of picture, 
that that creates a, a self consciousness that is um you know that I think I think is is also draining. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, it's interesting, Mike, if I could just interject what we've yeah. done at R3 Continuum, which I love this idea, it wasn't my idea when I think our ops director came up with this because she read an article is we we tacitly or explicitly gave permission for people to go off camera. Whether it's because their kids are screaming in the background or their dogs barking or maybe they didn't clean up. Some, some of our folks were doing these calls from their bedrooms, right? There's a number of reasons why you would want to do that. But that really gave permission for people to say, as long as you're still focused within reason, as you normally would be in the office, you can go off camera if you need a relief. Yeah. And, and you know, also, I wonder, you know, that, that I've, I've heard that some people are more focused when they can be also a little distracted. You know what I mean? That they, they're... You know, they're doodling or something, yes. right? Yes. But being on camera where you just sort of have to lock your eyes into the camera and you can't do that, I think that's also very stressful for people. And turning off the cameras is a, is a really good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> so what are the – speaking of boundaries, here, here's, here's a question I want to, I want to ask. You know, what – are there any limits or or are there boundaries in terms of how realistic it is – to expect a mental wellness program to perform in terms of addressing potential source sources of mental unwellness, right? Are, are there certain things that a wellness, a mental, a corporate mental wellness program can or can't do despite your best of intentions, throwing all the resources at it that you want, or is anything on the table? Could a, can a well-constructed, well-funded mental wellness program achieve almost anything you want? I don't think it can achieve anything you want. I think what it can do, it, it, it can really help prevent a host of uh, developing issues like anxiety, depression, substance abuse, even suicidal ideation. It can't fully prevent those. But what it can do is help catch those upstream when they're developing and then get people to the proper resources, be they formal clinical treatments or what we call more organic supportive resources like peer, su peer support, mindfulness programs, psychoeducational uh, training, things of that nature. That could be really helpful. And by doing that, the upside is that can impact morale. It could impact productivity, and which has a bottom line impact on businesses. And most importantly, it can impact cultural cohesion and cultural engagement. It impacts talent retention, all of those. There are some limits, though. So some things I think it cannot really do is if somebody has a moderate to severe mental health problem, they probably need clinical, formal clinical treatment. They need to be referred to proper uh, treatment providers that can address that either through psychotherapy and or medications. It's important to know that it can't, it can't do all of that. The other thing I don't think it can do fully without a separate approach is we see that there's a host, and we certainly have seen in 20 and 21, a host of cultural tensions that emerge at the workplace, be they related to political, ethnic, racial, gender, regional differences. The big, the big two that we've been involved in a great deal are the collective response to the murder of George Floyd and the demonstrations and those demonstrations that then turned into riots. Um, and then, of course, mask mandates and vaccine mandates. These are really tough hot points that although a wellness program can raise the emotional IQ of your, of your employees and they can alleviate how that tension manifests, if you want to address those kind of cultural issues, you need, a, you need to address them head on in, in some different ways. A wellness program can complement that process very well, but it is not in and of itself going to take those cultural issues away or off the table. You know, and I'm glad you brought that up because it, it leads into a question I wanted to make sure to cover it is, is that what if, and I'll bet you've encountered this, what if the company itself is the source of the mental unwellness, right? You know, the, the, new, the new word in everybody's lexicon now is toxic, right? And they're, they're toxic people, they're toxic workplaces, uh, I think that social media has amplified toxicity in a in a profound way, profound and pervasive way. Um, and, and 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 as you as as a company reflects on or considers putting in a mental wellness program, 
um, is it possible they're going to find that they've seen the enemy and it is, it is us, right? That they may be actually def- self-defeating because they're the cause of the mental unwellness to begin with. 100% I agree with that. It can be very counterproductive. You know, the issue is, and I, and I said this earlier, but it's, it's important to just say it again. It's really important to know thyself as an organization, to know your culture, know your employees, know your leaders, know your pain points. You know, the, the, it's interesting, Mike, the, the image that comes to mind is imagine you spend $10,000 to landscape your backyard. Landscaper comes in, does wonderful, works for weeks and does great. It looks like a Zen garden when they leave. And then for the next six months, you don't do anything. You don't water, you don't mulch, you don't weed. What happens, right? It falls in complete disarray. We have seen um, some companies who do a pretty good launch of a wellness program or they, or they partner with groups like R3 or others. And we do a, a really good launch working in tandem with them, but they're not dealing with their cultural toxicity. And that just undermines the foundation on which all of that is based. What's really interesting when you think of a physical wellness, bring in massage therapists, have a dietitian come in. Um, there's a number of other ways you can do that. In part, you need to be engaged in that process for it to be beneficial, but there's physical benefits that one can get without necessarily voluntarily being engaged in the process. When you think of mental wellness, the recipient has to have buy-in. They have to believe in it and they have to do the work. And if you if you don't have a culture of trust, if you have a culture of stigmatization against feeling vulnerable or admitting that you have mental health challenges... A program, the best program in the world just isn't going to take off. So it's a really poignant question that you raise. So in, in point of fact, this, this may be something that might be considered hand in hand with a, a leadership and cultural evaluation, right? Because it seems to me one of this, this is a real double edged sort of a mental wellness, pro, a mental wellness program is that if you put that in, you may find things out about your organization that aren't, you don't necessarily love, right? I can easily see a scenario in which you put in a mental wellness program and, you know, let's say you have uh, tele um, mental health consultations and then an employee says, yeah, I'm not the underperformer. My boss is really toxic. I'm quitting. Yes. I mean, that's a very real, that's a very real possible outcome, right? That's absolutely right. And and you, you know, you may, you may, I kind of even wonder if if before you put in a mental wellness program, you may want to do some sort of self-evaluation to make sure that you're not, again, you're not the one causing the mental unwellness in the first place. I think that's very important. And that's why that engagement all the way from top to bottom of getting input from certainly from leadership, that's important, middle management, all the way down to your frontline employees is critical. So you can understand what those insights are. And it's critical to do it in a way Um, I recommend doing that in an anonymous way so that people can feel more comfortable being open and there won't be backlash on their job. Because what you really want is you don't necessarily want people to fall in line in that step of the process. You want really honest and candid, um, almost gut punch data. So you can take a really good appraisal of where are we as a company and what what are the pain points that we need to solve along those lines. Totally agree with that. So, you know, you, you've done this for a long time, and of course, you're right in the middle of it with, with coronavirus. How do you, are you able in any way to measure kind of the ROI of putting programs like this, like this in? What, what have you seen in terms of improved company performance, bottom line wise, for companies that have successfully implemented mental wellness programs? Yes. Again, great question. And it's something that if you go back five years and certainly 10 years ago, there was some studies that showed ROI, but I don't think they were nearly as well developed. What we're seeing just in the last two years is what I'd refer to as an explosion of studies looking at what is the ROI, not not only in terms of human impact, but also in terms of bottom line. And the ultimate conclusion, I'll, I'll give you a quick, a quick uh, data point from ca- a Canadian study that was done recently. Um, it, you know, you have to make a business case for the benefit as well at some point to get that buy-in. Yep. So what's interesting is Deloitte did a study um, 
Now, this was November of 2019. So what's interesting here is that was actually at the front end uh, or just before uh, the pandemic. And they were looking at um, a wellness program across 10 different large companies in Canada. And what they found is going in, they estimated that 10% of those employees across that sample size um, had depression. And the annual cost of depression, and now this is in the U.S., is 31 to $51 billion in terms of lost productivity, absenteeism, presenteeism, and so on. And what we know is the World Economic Forum estimates that the cost globally is going to be $6 trillion, and that's for mental health problems globally, the, the, just the, the, the business loss or the cost of decreased productivity. What's interesting is when they did this study and they looked at productivity, they looked at engagement of employees, they looked at talent acquisition and overall throughput of work. They found that after three years, there was a 60% ROI on dollars spent. And after four plus years, four, five, six years, that ROI went up 118%. And that's based on the set, on the productivity and the output and the creative um, inventivism, if you will, or ingenuity that people were bringing to the table. Because the hard reality is, if you have a burned out, exhausted, anxious, depressed core group in your workforce, they're not being innovative. They're not being collaborative. They are getting by day by day, and they're not pushing the envelope from a business perspective. That's not the talent you want. Um, well, you want that talent, but what I want, you, you want that talent to be more at a place of wellness and thriving is what I meant by that. So one, one question that, that comes to mind and probably may come to mind to, with some of our listeners is that um, we're reading all over the place that, that this, is, this is a great time to be a therapist or a psychologist or psychiatrist, right? You, you know, most, most doctors are just not – they're not even taking new patients right now. You can't get a consult. Um, how do companies kind of address that or not let that stand in the way of providing resources to their employees? So – First, that's an absolute harsh reality right now. One of the benefits, and, and you said this earlier in your opening um, points, and what's interesting is a side note, in my uh, work with my telepsych company, we've been doing telehealth for almost 19 years. And for up until the pandemic, we struggled with a lot of hospitals getting them to really adopt a telemental health approach. As you said earlier, Mike, as soon as COVID hit, it was like overnight, that acceleration adoption just accelerated. So an upside is that there are a lot more options of access to therapists, psychiatrists, social workers, psychologists, and so on um, via telemental health. And those definitely should be explored. If you are a company or an HR director or a company leader, and you are not open to telemental health options, you are, you are really missing out on a wonderful opportunity to expand the reach of resources to your employees. And, and very soon you're really falling behind. So that's one point. Hmm. Um, the difficulty though is I would say that corporations, companies, particularly HR directors, I think they really need to demand and expect their EAPs to continue to build those networks in a way that can meet their clients' needs. Um, they're paying for services. And it's important that those networks be developed, be they in-site or on-site evaluations and treatment or telemental health services. So that's one thing I would recommend that if you have an EAP in place, really have dialogue with them about what are the options that you're offering and how are you shoring up those service gaps? I think that's really important. Now, aside from, aside from, direct consultations with, uh, with, with, with therapists, what are some other examples of, of features of, of wellness programs that, that companies can put in place or offerings, if you will? Yeah, certainly, certainly. So uh, what we tend to see in, in those that are more, most successful is we tend to see an array of offerings. So these can include psychoeducational resources. Many of those are online trainings, various videos, how to manage conflict at home, how to ha handle marital conflict, how to handle conflict with your teenage child, managing anxiety, navigating through a panic attack, 
again, again, I could go on. There's like, could be hundreds of topics. We actually have um, a software program that we've developed that has well over a hundred different modules on mental health and mental wellness that people can choose and get a quick three to five minute kind of video on either educating them on the nature of the condition or the symptoms or helping them navigate and understand how to navigate those symptoms. There's a lot of programs out there that, that, that do that. Another would be these programs really should also have a factor of peer support and empowering a culture of support. And what I call empowering a culture of vulnerability, where it destigmatizes mental health, it allows people to feel like they have support, and it allows people to feel safe to reach out and say, I need some help. It's important to have a clear communication plan and roll out the program. We see good programs where half the employees don't even understand the program exists or understand how the program can benefit them. Beyond that, emotional and physical health education adoption and integration into the culture, self-help or mindfulness initiatives, peer support, disruptive event management is something R3 does a great deal of across the U.S. and globally, helping people adjust to traumatic or disruptive events that occur at the workplace. Early intervention support, whether it's destigmatizing campaigns, mental health first aid, all of these are all other things that we provide. And then at some point, helping people identify when do you need more formal clinical treatment, mental health treatment, and then linking people to resources so they can access that. One last thing I'll add that I don't think is explored enough is developing access to what I call organic community resources. I mean, it used to be, and for some of us, it still is. It used to be where you can go to your church. You can go to your local clubs. You can go to your local neighborhood groups um, ethnic groups, whatever it may be, and you can still get a lot of support. Now we have a culture by which many of us move around state by state. We are more disjointed than we were pre-COVID, and it's harder to access some of those more natural supports or organic supports. So I think that's another thing that um, programs should consider as well. Now, what what about what about things that are really sort of real sort of uh... I want to get a little bit granular with you, if that if that's okay. You know, things sure. like like encouraging uh, meditation or meditation training, breathing exercises. Um, you know, a big one might be, for example, organizing, trying to organize some kind of group events, whether in person or remotely, because you know one of the one of the the downsides for many people um, for remote working is loneliness um, and, and isolation. Now. Not for me. I'm an extreme introvert, so my you know my wife is not concerned about me cheating on her. Her her biggest concern is that I'm going to be picked for the Mars mission because I'm like you're going to put me in a tin can by myself for three years. I'm in. Um, <laughs> nice. But unfortunately, they don't they don't want fat old people on the on the mission, so there's no danger of that. But the point is that that you know sort of the, these other programs that just tr- try to be a little bit kind of interventional. I guess my question is: Are they are they used with any effectiveness in the workplace alongside the other things that you're describing? I think they are. I think what's really interesting is mindfulness and meditation programs, including just apps, right? There's been a proliferation of apps that talk about this as well. The, the value that they have shown over time, over the last five plus years has really been astounding in terms of people just being, more, more, more mindful, more aware of what they're feeling, more aware of developing conflicts or symptoms over time. And I think that has been a huge development forward that has, now this is hard to measure, but I think, I, I believe anecdotally and based on 20 some years of experience, it has been a huge benefit in helping people stem off more severe development of not only interpersonal conflict, but um, other symptoms, you know, developing more severe symptoms of depression or anxiety. I also feel it has a counter. These things not only prevent things from getting bad, they help us do better. They help us perform better. They help us have more meaningful relationships. Um, They help us um, have more happiness and moments of gratitude in our life. So I think that those are very powerful um, aspects to a program without doubt. 
So, um, uh, how expensive are these programs? I, I I understand that it depends on how kind of deep you want to go. I'm sure there are Cadillac programs and there are, there are, there are cheaper programs. Um, but let's let's say relative to a conventional healthcare, you know, physical health program, are are, are mental wellness programs or should companies expect to spend roughly as much? or more than or less than whatever they're spending on their physical health programs? That's a tough one to answer. I've got some insights that I'll offer. Please take these with a certain degree of flexibility. Okay. Um, I, I have to say that, of course, it'll vary by scope and size. We have we work with companies that want to roll out a mindfulness meditation program. That can be really focused and relatively inexpensive, depending on the nature of what they want to do. We've, we've had companies that want to roll out an app that's already well-developed on the app store or on the Android store, and they just want some communication around benefits of using it. That can be really kind of low budget, relatively speaking, and still can have some good um, some value. And then there's companies that want to offer a full menu of all the things I already talked about in terms of the full comprehensive menu. So that will depend a great deal. Um, the key, I think, is identifying the needs and the pain points of your organization and then prioritizing. What is it that you want to impact first? And realize that even the biggest, best programs out there with the most resource-laden companies that make billions of dollars a year, none of them do all of this that we're talking about today, Mike. None of them do all of it. So if you're starting out, you know, the old, the old saying, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? Mm -hmm. So start with where do you think your biggest pain points are? What do you think you're going to get the best buy-in from employees all the way up to leadership? And start with that. It might be a psychoeducational, you know, training library. It might be a mindfulness program. It might be just offering peer support groups so people can talk about what they're struggling with um, pertinent to remote, you know, work, work home or work from home. Interestingly, at R3, we offered a parenting support interface, kind of a peer support for parents, including some resources. And what we did is we actually sent those parents a three-month subscription to Tinker Crate. And I don't know if you know what Tinker Crate is, but it's kind of it's like a it's like a little kit where kids at different ages, it's developmentally appropriate for different ages. They could put together different types of little engines or little uh, you know mechan you know mechanized things, and it's kind of a nice scientific based project that they can do. Well, what we had is we had a whole bunch of our single workers say, what about us? We're still struggling. And in a way we're struggling more because I'm, I'm home alone in an apartment. I don't have a wife, a husband or two kids or, and so it made us really think, darn, we really missed that. And so we pivoted and we offered other support resources. Um, but that's what I would say. It's really hard to come up with a, a price tag because the scope could vary greatly. What I will say, I would not expect it to cost as much as the physical wellness. I so I, I have a view and you, you tell me if I'm, I'm full of it or not. But I, I, think, I think one thing that, that mental and physical wellness programs have in common is that in the right circumstance, you can get a lot of bang for the buck with a very minimal investment, right? Those tinker crates, I think, is a great example, right? It might cost you $20 per month per employee, maybe, right? But but that can make that can make a huge difference, right? And if that if that totally. if that keeps a, a an employee you know happier, more stable, more actualized for a couple of weeks after that. Boy, what a what a great investment! Yeah, right. I I I I can't I can't agree more. I you know what's interesting, Mike? I think of those times in my life where I'm having a really rough day, and I'm checking out at the grocery store, and the the the, the person at the the you know the register clerk or the cash register says, "Boy, I really like your haircut," or or I love that shirt, and out of the blue, it has taken me from really. It, you know, listen, I'm not feeling like the Dalai Lama. Like I'm not, even, you know, absolutely at the zenith of my happiness as a result, but it just lifts me enough to feel like, boy, that was kind of nice. And that then sets in motion a trajectory of incremental steps throughout the rest of the day or the night where I keep improving on that. The, I call those emotional strokes, small emotional strokes 
that give you that just uplift, that just give you that feeling of I'm not alone. These other people or these leaders get it. They understand what I'm dealing with. And this was just a nice little small blessing for me today. Those make a big difference. They really do. I'm talking with George, with Dr. George Vergolius, and the topic is, should I start a mental wellness program at my company? Um, running out of, we're running out of time, unfortunately, so I only have time for a couple more questions. But one I, I do want to make sure we get out there is, how, how do companies or what are best practices for companies to measure whether their wellness programs are, are working, are doing the job they're being asked to do? So certainly what I would say is you have to start by being very clear on what are you trying to achieve? Absolutely. You just, you need to know that. What are you trying to achieve? What are the goals? And then operationalizing, operationalizing those in a way that you can measure them. And what I tend to do is I tend to put it into two buckets. One is satisfaction because you want your employees and your leaders to have engagement in the program. And often that is a, a, a in its highest form, it's a satisfaction type question or a series of questions. How's the program working? Do you feel you're getting better? Do you, do you feel it meets your needs and so on? But what you, by the way, a lot of companies stop there. I'm a big fan and some people may not agree with me, but I'm a big fan that satisfaction doesn't always indicate outcome or functional benefit. I can be very happy with a therapist and I'm still not getting better. And one of the reasons I'm happy with a therapist is they're not challenging me to get better. Hmm. Think of a physical therapist or think of a personal trainer that doesn't piss you off occasionally, right? Or, or get you angry. That's not a very good uh, physical therapist and that's not a very good personal trainer. So you, what you also need to measure is what are the behavioral functional changes that are occurring over time? And from a business perspective, what is the, the, the productivity or the impact on the business that is promoting the business forward. It could be increased team collaboration. It could be a measure of increased innovative ideas. It could be increased operational efficiency. There's a number of ways companies can define that. But that's what I would say that you need to answer both of those buckets, satisfaction, and then what I call functional outcome. And that has two types, the behavioral and and kind of functional aspect of the individual, and then the business functional improvement that you're seeing as a result. That's how I would structure that. Yeah. And, and I, it, it occurs to me, I wonder if, I'll bet you there are KPIs that can be structured around this. You know, for example, it could be productivity, it could be turnover, it could be tenure, um, in, in some cases, Absolutely. even even your pay scale, right? Absolutely. You have to pay people more to work for you just because you're not all that pleasant to work with. Absolutely. Um, George, this has been a great conversation. I've got about 10 more questions I'd love to ask, but, but we're running out of time. <laughs> I understand. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that there are questions that, that our listeners would have liked me to cover that we didn't or would have liked us to cover in more depth. If they'd like to follow up with you on some of these issues, can they do so? And if so, what's the best way to do that? Absolutely. So you can do so by emailing me at George, G-E-O-R-G-E dot Virgolius. V as in Victor, E-R-G-O-L-I-A-S at r3c.com. Or uh, my, my office line, feel free to give me a call as area code 952-641-0645. Uh, and I'd be happy to engage. That's going to wrap it up for today's program. I'd like to thank Dr. George Vergolia so much for sharing his expertise with us. What an educational and important podcast episode. If you're a small business owner, make sure you check out Mike Blake and the Decision Vision podcast, where Mike covers topics and issues small business owners are facing and talks with experts about solutions for those issues. If you'd like more information on mental wellness programs or are looking for different strategies to offer the best support and resources for your employees, R3 Continuum can help. Learn about R3 Continuum services and contact us at www.r3c.com or email us directly at info at r3c.com.